Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. Sean is on the switcher. This evening, we chat live, we talk no comparison comparisons. I share your viewer wrist shots. We have a ball tonight on watches tonight. Guys, if you enjoy this program, the party continues. Follow me on Instagram, Tim underscore Masso. You can see none of those are run of the mill watches. I post the best stuff on my Instagram page. 2,500 one minute watch reviews. You can binge watch my Instagram. And some of those watches aren't even on our website. This is the only place you can see them. So check me out, Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. In the box, Edward Ledden, Desilus 2, Marques from Brooklyn, Arto Charles from New York City, Enrique Cassiano, Soma R from Budapest, Joe Tyson, Apex North Carolina in the house. Watches with Dennis from the Heartland in Kansas, Time Hill from the Mid-Atlantic in Virginia, alongside him, David R from Washington, D.C. We've got Noah Guillaume from Chicago, Ivan John, and we've got Miroslav joining us from vacation in Turkey. He's staying up late with us. And Eric from Syracuse in upstate New York. Rich Buddy asking, am I a fan of Roger Dubuis? Pre-2004, almost uniformly. Post-2004, I gotta pick my moments. Okay, guys, if you're near Philly or New York City, please reach out to me. We're programming our collector conversations for the fall and we would love to get you in. Come here or visit us in New York City. Both work, that's where Watchbox is. And any place where Watchbox is, I would like to come to you to talk about your collection, philosophy, and your history as a collector. From the beginning to the present, what you like, what you don't, and how your tastes were shaped. You're the star on Collector Conversations, but you gotta reach out to me, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, viewer wrist shots, revving up. Tarek H features a his and hers showcase of the Rolex GMT Master II. He says this was inspired by our Collector Conversation with Tim and Kate Mancuso. And wouldn't you know it, the Mancusos joined the party from a dog Dog hike in Idaho, double Rolex in Idaho, greener than I expected. We've got CM who shares the incomparable porcelain dial of the mighty Crador H2 in rose gold, hand painted by the way. Jeff R sent this stunning sky dweller shot, well sky dwelling on a paraglider over Aspen, that's a first. That might be the best shot we've ever had. And Daniel R. overlooks the Chicago skyline from Soho House with his Patek Aquanaut 5066. Jimmy Y. is at Dana Point, California with his Rolex GMT Batman. Okay guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. McLauder joining in. Gags joining in from Ascot, UK. We got Thomas Burnett, Kyle Kyle Anderson from Malaga. We got Junior Johnson from Michigan. Eric Nielsen from North Carolina. Scott I joining live for the first time. Welcome, Scott. We're glad to have you. And Leon S driving through Indiana. All right, we got our Indiana transient. Where are you going? Let me know. Randy Bridges, I'm wondering what Carl F. Booker can do to increase awareness of the brand. Well, I think Keanu's done with the John Wick movies, so after that, your guess is as good as mine. Speaking of which, I'm wearing the Tread 1F that was featured in Infinity War and Endgame, a watch Downey Jr. actually wore unsponsored. Fun fact, it's American made. All right, what else is going on? Time Hill saying the Crador is amazing, and of course, I gotta spoil the moment for him with like the anti-Crador. Okay, Oris versus Rolex. Guys, is this even a thing? There's nothing more satisfying than finding a premium experience in an economical package. For example, in the early 1990s, a German Mercedes-Benz engineer named Eberhard Schultz created a V12 gull-winged mid-engine supercar called the Commendatore 112i. His company was called Isdera. It was ruinously expensive and fabulously exotic. They didn't make many of them, for obvious reasons. But at the same time, a sub-brand of Mazda created like a 60% scale version of the same thing in the riotously fun turbocharged three-cylinder gull-wing-doored AutoZam AZ1 microcar. And that's when I saw at a car show in Hong Kong. And frankly, between the two, which would I rather drive? You don't really have to ask that question, do you? 
it would be the 1500 pound go-kart with the turbo. Tonight's show subverts logic and expectations by comparing unequal watches that have become shockingly comparable and become shockingly comparable er the more you look at them. You could call this episode Buy This Not That. All right, who's in the box? Some R is a Crador fan, Time Hill as well. John Goodman joining in, we got Andrew T, we got Abdul joining in from either Egypt or Germany, let me know where you are this week. And Jared Lacourt saying, any way a tread could be self-powered by quartz? Well, you would need some sort of solar panel or piezoelectrics, and I don't think it would give you enough current, but it could extend the battery. That would be an interesting concept. Noah is wearing his blue aquas right now. Hmm, a shadow of the future. So. Rolex Submariner versus Oris Aqua State. Guys, this is the main event. This is Yankees Red Sox, or actually, I guess this would be more like Yankees versus the College World Series champion with the college team coming through with the upset. So here's how it goes. In 1950, the Rolex Submariner launched a legend. Some early models, especially the big crowns with Explorer dials, are worth real estate money. Modern versions arguably represent the most recognizable watch model in the world, certainly the one that is most copied. You will see $50 fake Submariners on the streets in Hong Kong, London, and New York City. Here's the thing. Subs are also expensive when new. $10,800, and yes, they charge a premium for the green bezel. They become more so when they're used. The prices only escalate from MSRP. Fortunately, the functional limits of the Rolex Submariner are unremarkable, and it's easy to find a capable surrogate for thousands of dollars less. It, well, here's the thing, guys. You know where this is going. You saw the thumbnail. But Rolex now has a 41 millimeter sub, which means it has never been a better one-for-one -one comparison to the 41.5 millimeter Oris Aqua State. Now, we got the Aqua State caliber 400 back in 2020. The next year, we got the one that we really wanted, the 41.5, and that is it. This is a spectacular package. It matches the sub's 300 meter dive depth as well as its combination of steel sheen and green. It also features a ceramic capped 120 click bezel, a full bracelet, stainless steel construction, a dive extension that folds out of the clasp, an all applique upscale dial, but the Oris does more by offering a 10 year warranty. That's confidence in your product. Five years, that's Rolex, that's industry standard. Eight years, that's a lot of Richemont brands. And of course, if you have Bayat Haldeman money, you get a lifetime warranty. But for those of us who are mere mortals, this is about as good as it gets, a full decade before it needs any service. Plus, you get features like a display case back, not available on the Submariner. Quick release bracelet, you can see the quick release mechanism underneath the lugs right there. It comes with an accessory strap so you can swap the look if you want to, and it's easy to do with a fingernail. Five day power reserve, automatic winding with a twin barrel manufacture movement that you can see. A silicon unlubricated escapement, part of the key to its long service interval. And of course, being twin barrel, it doesn't have the precipitous drop off in amplitude after 24 hours that you get even with a single barrel Rolex. Their service standards for amplitude after 24 hours, it's always been something like 270 to 280. It's going to be a whole lot better with two barrels in the Oris. The caliber even comes with an advertised anti-magnetic resistance of 2,250 gauss, which it goes without saying is far more than mil gauss. Plus, the accuracy per Oris via five position adjustment is supposed to be minus three plus five seconds per day. Now Rolex guarantees minus two plus two, but still the Oris is better than the chronometer standard of minus four plus six. And remember, to own all of this, available in several sizes and several vivid colors, you're looking at only $3,700. This is gonna leave money for a whole collection of watches you should have bought instead of that pre-owned Rolex Kermit. In fact, you could even buy the Oris Kermit. 
All right, what else is going on in the box? John N, 24 degrees, Paris Pat, joining in from Beaumont, Texas. So Paris Pat is a little bit of a misnomer, but he's there in spirit. We've got Wigmaster from New England, and Abdul says he's wearing his Anordain on the north coast of Egypt, enjoying the sunny Mediterranean. What else is going on? 24 degrees saying Rolex Submariner date for me all day long. It's true. I'm giving you value alternatives. What else is going on in the box? Rob K, greetings from Toronto. And Rob Anders from Long Island, my neck of the woods. We got Deech2086 from Western Massachusetts. And we got Airdam joining in from Manchester, UK, staying up late with Portugal from Boston. And Scott Wexlin, our local boy from Westchester. Speaking of Westchester, Drew Koblitz is coming to the studio to do another collector conversation tomorrow. Watches and cars, folks, look for it on Watchbox Studios. It'll be on the app. Okay, Rolex Daytona versus Zenith Chronomaster Sport. This one will live in infamy. The contention has barely settled even two years after <sighs> that Zenith became the most controversial watch of 2021. Guys, it's hard to believe the Cosmograph Daytona was once considered a tough sell and a third tier Rolex. It's true, even as late as the 1980s, it was often bundled with other more desirable watches, sometimes at a loss, just to get it out the door and out of the case. Today, the Rolex retail price for a new Daytona starts at $15,100 if you want steel with a white dial or a black dial, reflecting an almost comical tease and a ransom that almost nobody but the most privileged Rolex clients will have the opportunity to pay. Everyone else, most buyers, I have to say, will shop the new for 2023 Rolex Daytona and pay a huge aftermarket markup. How big? No one even knows. They're not online yet, making me wonder if the rollout has been slow or Rolex is having production problems. But please, hold your fire. You're going to pay 45 grand just to get the last model from previous model years. 45, 44, 43 grand. Remember, this is a $15,000 watch new, and almost everyone is going to have to buy it used, because unless you're on the A-list, you're waiting years to get one of these at retail price. There's nothing wrong with the Daytona, but is there anything $45,000 right about it in steel? I don't think so. Enter the most controversial watch of two model years ago, the Zenith Chronomaster Sport. Yes, it looks like a Daytona, and yes, that was the point. But it has a lot to recommend it, and frankly, everything that I like about the Daytona, I also like about the Zenith. It is shamelessly a 70%-ish duplicate of the Cosmograph Daytona. Yes, but it's also clearly a Chronomaster dial, and if you know your Zenith, you realize that is the spitting image of 1969. And the case looks less actionable from other angles, plus inside of it is the beating heart of an El Primero. We'll let the judges decide whether Zenith borrowed too much, but you can see right there, it is Zenith's own glorious caliber 3600 movement, and the lugs themselves, the case profile, it looks nothing like a Daytona, right down to the pump pushers, which are unmistakably Chronomaster. The Sport's $11,000 retail price is a real number that you can actually walk into a dealer and pay. Plus, there's a pre-owned market at this point with really good selection. Get it white dial, black dial, strap, bracelet. You can even get it in gold, and you're going to pay less than list. There was this fleeting moment when it looked like Zenith was going to be able to charge an extra premium on top of list or establish a waiting list for this watch or bundle it with other models, but that was over in a hot minute. Today, you can get discounts at dealers and aftermarket. You could pay up to $3,000 less. So if you want one, you can get one and you can get it now. Technically speaking, there's a lot to love about the sport. 41 millimeters, so very similar to the 40 millimeter Rolex, though a bit thicker and more bulky. The reward, though, is that you get a display case back and you can actually see the movement, which you can't, except on the most expensive precious metal Daytonas. You got the El Primero 3600, which is the second generation El Primero. 60 hour power reserve, hacking seconds is now a thing, and of course, the spectacular Foudreon striking 10th system with the classic 10 beat per second double step El Primero cadence and a silicon escapement. 
100 meters water resistant. Technically, it's audacious, it's interesting, in a lot of ways more so than the Daytona. And of course, there's so many identifiably Zenith elements here, plus the big price break. I can't fault it in any way. And if you're still on the fence about whether you can stomach a Rolex homage in a Zenith wrapper, you should know what I know. Rolex itself appears to have taken this as a compliment. How do I know that? Let's just say I heard it from the top of one of those companies, and I mean like very, very close to the top. So that is a secret between me and they, and it's an absolute fact, but we got a whole lot angrier about this than the primary parties. Okay, viewerist shots number two. Peter M. of Boston and his Ming 1709 Burgundy overlook the lake in Lugano, Switzerland. Picturesque. We've got Alvaro R. and his Breitling Avenger catching the news of the new watch box in Shanghai, China. That's right, we're in China. It's a small but elite shop. You can see all the fun stuff there. Check out my interview with Andy from Watchbox China. We also have JD in Pennsylvania gets to know his Rolex Deep Sea D Blue sourced from Jason Main at Watchbox. Thank you for trusting Jason and our company. Michael C. wears and watches his Ulysse Norden GMT Plus Minus Perpetual Calendar. Thank you for watching my hands-on videos. And Thomas B. and company share a his and hers featuring our hero watch of the night. It's an all Cartier shot. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Okay, unfair comparisons continued. Guys, wear a hard hat because there are falling prices ahead. Patek Nautilus versus Cartier Santos. So, Patek Philippe Nautilus 5800. When it launched last year, it proved that the definitive hype watch of our era wasn't going to follow the 5711 into the sunset. Sure, a specific reference was gone, but the jumbo was forever, and not even Patek could resist the temptation of bringing back its most recognizable watch. Fortified with a larger 41 millimeter case now in white gold, a new reference number and a retail price of just under $70,000, the core jumbo return followed almost immediately by jumbo aftermarket prices. Guys, fortunately, there's the Cartier Santos to Cartier in large size. It's large compared to the other Santos models. It's not objectively big, which means it's a very versatile and universally wearable watch. Redesigned in 2018 and updated with new dial variants on a yearly basis, this one's new for 23, the Santos gives you 119-year history of the world's first pilot's watch, the grandeur of the Cartier name, and fit to match the Patek. It's thin, it's short across the wrist, it's fine, it is packed with smart features. Now, not every Santos in this world is a smart choice, but pricing of this Cartier means you cannot lose. And we're talking $7,750 for a watch that is simply stacked and enduringly beautiful. Plus, you get Cartier's eight-year warranty when you register it with the company, which is just about as good as you will get anywhere. $7,750 is Omega money, and this Cartier has grace unmatched by any Omega. Omegas these days are technically interesting, but also really thick. Whereas this Cartier is just over nine millimeters thick. It's a sliver that slides underneath the cuff. It's only 47.5 millimeters lug to lug, which is nice and versatile, and 39.8 millimeters across. So again, this is considered to be the large model, but it's not large in the sense that some integrated bracelet sports watches are just unwieldy. There's tons of accessory straps. You're going to be spoiled for options. This is just a few different materials, different colors. Change the look of the watch and do it every day. Each example comes with an extra strap standard and there's some flexibility about which one you get at the Cartier dealer, so you do have some choice. The standout features of the Santos start with its bracelet. Not only does it feel robust and solid and far more expensive than it is, but you can see that there's a push button quick release system underneath that makes swapping easy. Then there's the smart link system and here's a little video that I shot of how it works. Not only is the bracelet the only one I've ever encountered 
counter that can be sized with a fingernail, but the quality of all these tiny components and the vault-like solidity of the whole belies the immense number of tiny moving parts in it. It is a wonder of engineering and quality control. Finally, the watch is loomed, automatic, and powered by a modest but manufactured Cartier caliber. The anti-magnetic resilience of the movement is not well advertised, but Cartier has confirmed that it is 1,200 Gauss, so mil Gauss and 200 more. Plus, water resistance is a credible and swimmable 100 meters, so this is a real sports watch. And while not every version of the Santos Large is loomed, this one is. And some, like the DLC Black, are fully loomed, hands and numerals. And since it's not worth Patek money, it's less likely than some... Well, it's less likely than some to inspire a person to do a Jamie Lannister on your hand to repossess that particular Santos. And I hate to broach this topic, but it's a real deal. Um, and especially in the major cities of the world these days, it's nice to wear something that's a little bit less expensive and lower in profile. All right, guys, what's going on in the box? Okay, someone liked the Santos joke right there. We have Wigmaster, contact and ambassador. I'm not sure in regard to what. And then we have O'Neill saying, hey, Tim from Chicago, from America's Midwestern metropolis. Glad to have our friends joining in. Mr. No Date asking, was that James Cameron strapped to a leg? I'm not sure. We'd have to go back. The Daytona movement is superior to the El Primero. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Is it thinner? Yes. Does it have an extra 10 hours of power reserve? Yes. Is the El Primero technically more interesting in just about every way? If it's the 3600, I'm going to have to say yes. And then we have Ivan John saying, I wanted to get the Chronomaster Sport, but didn't feel good enough holding it in my hands for some reason. To each his own. And then right here we have a comment. Tim may originally be from his district in, in passing reference to the Santos joke. No, but my North Shore home was very close. And then we have Mark S. asking, Tim, why are you pushing the Watchbox app? Why would I want that? Three reasons. One, you get all of our collector conversations before they post on our channel. Two, it's one place where you can view all of my videos easily. Three, if you want to shop watches, we've got them. Four, it allows you to aggregate all of the blogs, journals, and watch news sites that you like best, and then screen only the ones that you like and get a customized feed of all of that. We think that we've filled the gap left by Watchville, and we've created a fun media viewer that can also be used but doesn't necessarily need to be used as a shopping tool. What else is going on? We've got Zhao joining us from Portugal. Welcome. What else is going on? Well, what else is going on? The Blancpain 50 Fathoms. Blancpain makes the best high luxury dive watch on the market. I love the Blancpain 50 Fathoms. I would happily buy one, and I may yet buy one. But I will say this, in a world where the RGM Model 300 Professional exists, there is a credible value alternative on the table. Now, I love the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, but that price is heart-stopping for a base metal diver. And granted, this is the new 42.3 millimeter 70th anniversary watch. And in 1953, the 50 Fathoms, like the Rolex Submariner, helped to establish the modern format of the dive watch. So the history here is real. This is not astroturfed. This is not something that a marketing executive came up with in the Swatch Group in the last 20 years. This thing is true roots tool watch, but it's also got an elite price. And there's a 43.5 millimeter alternative from Lancaster, Pennsylvania that costs only $3,700 on a strap. It's also customizable. Blue dials, white dials, black dials, bezels to match, strap, bracelet, Tahitian mother of pearl. You've got a lot of options. You've got options that Blancpain does not offer. And it's true that the Salida SW300 powered RGM can't match the Blancpain's gorgeous five-day automatic movement, although, by the way, the RGM is now up to 56 hours of power reserve, but the American watch has other advantages. For one, the RGM has a captive bezel design like Zinn or Breitling, and its steel case is German machined, built like a tank with a 5mm sapphire, and equipped with a rare, super precision, 240-click micrometric diving bezel. 
I've only encountered one such bezel in my life, and it was on an RGM 300. In the inclusion of a full bracelet with a machined dive clasp, is a bargain at just $750 more than the strap. By the way, you can see this is a vintage watch you want review that I shot eight years ago. So you can see, despite its size, the Model 300 fits better than expected on a small wrist. And I don't know how she pulled it off, but I've seen a woman wear this watch on a strap. And yeah, it was convincing. The full bracelet on this thing feels bomb proof. Like you could use it to strangle a kangaroo. Absolutely imposing like the anchor chain of a battleship. And again, the bracelet's just 750 bucks more than the strap. The latest versions of the Model 300 also include a ceramic bezel insert and all examples have been tested to 2,500 foot water pressure that vastly surpasses the 50 fathoms roughly 984 foot rating. Moreover, there's an anti-magnetic soft iron inner shield that helps to narrow the advantage of the Blancpain's silicon anti-magnetic hairspring. Honestly, this is the toughest call for me. You know how much I love to support American watchmaking and American manufacturing. I've got my Corvette and Dan Reuter chronograph behind me. I've got the Devon Tread 1F on my wrist. And and you guys know that my guitars and my bikes are also made in America, which is to say I have real pride in the stuff that's made locally. But the 50 Fathoms makes every other luxury dive watch look like a pretender because they can't match its history unless they're Rolex or crude because they can't match its finish and execution. And yes, I'm including the Royal Oak Offshore Diver in that group. This thing is incredible, but if you don't have 70th anniversary money, good news. For under five grand, bracelet included, you're getting yourself into the RGM and then you can take the plunge. All right, viewer wrist shots number three. Kingsley Y hangs at the Sagrada in Barcelona with his Grand Seiko Spring Drive, SBGA 373. JCS goes full 1970s style with his monoblock case, Omega DeVille. That's a good one. Bogdan I and his Tudor Black Bay 58 enjoy seasonable weather on the water. Ethan S gives us sensational watches and wheels shots here with his Factor Disc Brake Road Bike and Omega Speedmaster 38. Guys, send me your bike shots. I like those. Josh P, a cycling fan in San Diego, shares his military spec marathon alongside the USS Midway. If you're out in San Diego and you're on the road, say hi to Cody and Bill at Holland Cycles for me. Okay, guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. What's going on in the box? Wolfbright's joining in saying, hi, Tim. Hi, Wolfbright. We got Robert Taylor saying, blow half 40% depreciation before you get home is painful. Yes, but this is a pre-owned watch retailer where I'm working here. So if you're wondering why to have the app on your phone, pre-owned 50 Fathoms from the 5015 Classic to the 5000 Bath Scaff to the 40.3 millimeter reference 5008, whatever 50 Fathoms you want, we've got it. And we've usually got them in stock. Jim Millett saying the movement's superb on the 50, and I gotta agree, some of the best bevels I've seen on a series production watch, and five day reserve, three mainspring barrels, free sprung, six position adjustment, anti-magnetic, super duper watch. Alan C saying in regard to our last wrist shot, that is one dressy marathon. What else going on in the box? Time Hill, one will have to consider the RGM, would not have realized this without my argument in, this fav in its favor. Well, you know, I always like to spread the word about lesser known watches. Sometimes it's gonna be Cartier instead of a Patek. You've heard of both of those brands. But when I can bring a small brand into the frame, particularly one that's made locally here in Pennsylvania. I'm always thrilled by the opportunity. Okay, unfair comparisons continued. Omega Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch versus Damasco DC86 Pilots Chrono. Lock and horns here. Omega's NASA flown moon watch isn't an outrageous proposition on a bracelet for 7,000 bucks, but I think we can do more for less here. The 42 millimeter Speedmaster Professional that I'm referencing is the solid case back version. You'll pay more for the Sapphire Sandwich. So here we're getting a solid back and a thermoplastic crystal. New for 2021, the Moonwatch Caliber 3861 is an acceptable 50-hour manual wand chronometer chronograph. It's anti-magnetic, very shock tolerant, and crisp in the hand for a cam chrono. What's the alternative? Well, how about 
Damasco, which can't compete on history and heritage, so it brings the tech and the spec. This 42 millimeter German chronograph comes out swinging with 100 meter water resistance the moon watch can't match, so swim with confidence. Add 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic hardening, and it's least tough against magnetism, if not quite as invulnerable as the Omega. But here's where Damasco really starts to open the gap. The bezel of the pilot's Damasco adds a new dimension of functionality that the Omega can't match. And Damasco adds custom options so you can actually have your bezel calibrated one of three different ways. You can have it in a 12 hour scale, you can have it count up or count down. The choice is yours. Ice hardened steel, guys. Media blasted, it's got sort of a yellow sheen to it when you look closely, but over 800 Vickers hard, beyond three times the hardness and scratch resistance of standard watchmaking steel, and this is a Damasco patent and innovation. For a premium of 720 bucks, this German's pilot's watch gains a proprietary bracelet on which every single link is both ice hardened, removable, and fixed by a hex screw, so each screw can take more torque without rounding off and stripping. It is a miracle of engineering by itself. The loom is fierce, and the DC-86 is packed with information, including a second time zone in 24-hour format, the date, which the Omega does not have, a central mounted chronograph minutes hand, like a Lemania 5100, and all chrono functions readily distinguishable by a bright color, in this case. The Damasco matches the Omega's power reserve at 50 hours, but adds the practicality of automatic winding on a 7750 base that's heavily modified for the purpose by Damasco. All up with the optional bracelet, your damage for the Damasco is going to be $4,290 out the door. And yes, simple white orange and black versions of the dial exist if you don't like the Tim Masso signature green. Plus, there's a hard black coated case if you want something that's even more technical and tactical looking on your wrist. All of which is to say there's options here and features that the Omega cannot match. And again, for thousands less than the iconic Omega. Jumping into the box, we got Deech saying Damasco, great value on secondary, love it. True, cheaper to buy new, cheaper to buy used. What else is going on in the box? We got Eli saying, just bought a Moser. Looking forward to picking it up in Zurich. Sent you a picture of what is on my wrist. I will try to make sure I get that in. I cannot always use every wrist shot I get because I get too many for the show. Sean would be uploading images all day. And then we got Thomas Burnett saying, love the look of that Damasco. Neat watch, great value, guys. It's 42 millimeters just like the Omega. So it is a size for size replacement. Now, what else can I say about our box? We got Ivan Jan saying, I love these comparisons. By the way, Ivan Jan, if I'm mispronouncing your name and I've been doing it for weeks, please let me know. Fries with Mayo saying, it didn't go to the moon. To which I respond, guess what? The moon watch you buy in the boutique also didn't go to the moon. What else is up? <laughs> well, how about some dress watches? How about auto logerie? And options that give you more customization for less money and just as much fun. F. Pigeon, the Chronomet Bleu. This is a watch that I have in stock. I can sell it to you used for a lot of money right now. But I want you to know that I'm also your advocate as a fellow watch collector, which is why the Sartori Biard SB05 needs to be considered as an optional alternative. Launched in 2009, as a point of entry to the Journ brand, the Tantalum Chronomet Bleu arguably has become the company's definitive design statement and most sought model. Although retail price has soared from the low $20,000 range over the last decade, the 39mm Chronomet Bleu's retail of $39,800 still represents a pretty good value at half of what these watches command on secondary markets, in fact, less than half. All of which to say, if you can get it new, that's the way to buy it. You'll be a rich man if you ever decide to sell, and frankly, Jorn is not gouging. But I think you can spend even less, $10,000 to $20,000, on something of equal merit and even greater exclusivity. Let me check out what is going on in the box here. By the way, Ivan Jan, please let me know if I'm mispronouncing your name. And that goes for anyone in our chat box. So, what costs ten dollars to $20,000 less than a new Chronomet Blue? How about the 38.5mm Sartori Biard 
SB05, a full custom offering offered from self-taught artisan Armand Biard of France. He makes many of the dial components himself, especially the hands. He is an industrial designer by trade. He is a longtime watch entrepreneur and he has a highly refined taste in design, but he's willing to let you take the controls of your own SB05. While the production ramp up from the 2021 launch of this model has been slow, each example is fully bespoke. Guilloche on a sterling silver dial base, hands that are manually crafted, color combos to your spec. Do you want meteorite? Do you want malachite? Do you want both on the same dial with Eastern Arabic numerals and compound hands? You got it, done. Guilloche, polished titanium, aventurine, Others are offered, there is no limit. The most elaborate guilloche dials are done by Kari Voudelainen's Kamblamin, which is a fantastic retort to the work done by Jorn's dial factory, Cadranier de Genève. All dials are handcrafted by Armand and select partners who work at the highest level. Literally everything is customizable. This is just part of the scope of what's possible. And this palette merely shows you the different stones available for dials. You want more than one type of abalone? You got it. And yes, tantalum is offered if you want to trade blows with FP and frankly that blows the chronomet bleu out of the waters of Lake Geneva. You'll pay thousands more for this than a stock SB05 but still get out the door for thousands less than a Jorn even at the Jorn's MSRP. Jorn's gold movement is handsome and admirably crafted. It's also very accurate, but it's also simple and offers only 56 hours of power reserve. The SB05's caliber, by comparison, runs for 90 hours, fills the case back handsomely, and comes custom finished for Sartori Biard from partner La Jupere. Viewer wrist shots number four. Guys, that is my alternative, my artisanal alternative to the Chronomet Bleu. We have Thomas Burnett saying, what a selection of dials. AH asking, Tim, can you post the link to this watch? Uh, just search for Sartori Biard, it'll come right up. It's not hard to find. Uh, I could probably put something in the description, but you could start Googling before this stream ends and find it quicker than I could give it to you. We've got Eli joining in from Germany, which I always appreciate. Ivan Jan saying, I'm used to much worse pronunciations. The J is not Y, Ivan Jan. Okay, that's how it is. Okay, perfect. I'll get that right in the future. Wrist shots number four. Stephen E. dazzles with his GOCQ panorama date in a classical loom shot. Matthew C. and his Bremont hit the road in his Mercedes Benz. I love watches and wheels. Joseph P. models his Chopard Mille Milia anniversary on a custom Aaron bespoke strap. We've got Chitanya K. and his Tissot PRX in ice blue from behind the wheel of his Infinity. And Pravin K of Malaysia takes us home with two flavors of Moonwatch while Buzz looks on approvingly. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Guys, thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. Let me know in the description below, do you take the original or do you take the alternative? Thanks to Sean for running a blasting cast and to all of you who joined live. And by the way, thanks to Devin for keeping the time. I love these silly things and that will never, ever end. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.